thanks to the organizers for shaping this great conference. It's a real pleasure to see you here today. Um, and I'm very happy to show you a, a new project I've been uh, involved in recently and to show you some of the results we are discussing uh, at the moment. So ectomacrosa, ectomacrosal fungi are keystone species of the forest ecosystems um, because forest soils are often limited in resources. Most trees rely on uh, ectomacrosal fungi symbiosis for their nutrition. So this is really amazing how many of these interactions are going on here into the soil. We are talking about 20,000 ectomacrosa fungi uh, that are, have established symbiosis with about uh, 6,000 forest trees. So this is really a lot. So ectomacrosa is uh, an inter-kingdom uh, symbiotic organ. Um, between uh, a tree here and uh, a fungus. So the tree provides uh, carbohydrates compounds here, uh, resulting from uh, photosynthetic activities. And uh, the fungal partner is providing uh, nutrients uh, like phosphorus or nitrogens. So understanding uh, the genetic uh, determinants of these ectomacrosal uh, fungi is a long-standing research question. Um, it has started in the 90s with microbiologists who wanted to understand uh, whether viability and high irritability uh, was involved in this was involved in these ectomacrosal traits in pine populations. Uh, about 10 years later, um, with quantitative genetic studies, um, it has been shown in Poplar this time that um, there is, it looks like there is a, a genetic basis in this uh, ectomacrosa formation. And recently, um, a, re a reciprocal transplant experiment has shown that uh, uh, for macrosal traits, there is a highly irritable genetic variation, but surprisingly no patterns of local adaptation. So the research questions of today is, uh, what is the genetic basis uh, for the development of ectomacrosal traits? Uh, second, uh, do transcriptomic profiles vary be between lifestyles? And I will explain this in a minute. So to answer these questions, uh, we use uh, Pisolitus, Microcarpus, and Poplar clones as a model system, uh, but from a fungus perspective. So that's what you see here, this little Poplar clone and the Pisolitus microcarpus forms these very nice macrosis. Uh, I have to say that uh, um, actually it's a project that has been initiated uh, by colleagues in uh, Nancy, uh, in I, Nancy, uh, with Myra, De Fitex, and Anna Gret. And uh, they, they carry out all the experimental work I'm presenting today. So, Pisolitus microcarpus uh, is an interesting uh, model system. It's a basidomacota with a very large uh, geographic distribution in South Hemisphere, with some important junctions in North Hemisphere as well. Um, not in, na in nature, it forms uh, ectomacrosis with eucalyptus and acacia species, but it's interesting because it can also form macrosis with uh, broadleaf species and, uh, and uh, poplar, for example. So it's quite easy to cultivate uh, and isolate, and it has a pretty good uh, reference genome uh, with about 70,000 uh, genes annotated. So the life cycle of this uh, Basidomycota is uh, characterized by a short stage uh, with haploid monocarriant here after germination. Um, that is followed by a long stage with uh, uh, dicaryotic uh, uh, mycelium. So here the cells comprise two infused uh, nuclei into the mycelium, so it's quite special. And under adverse environmental conditions, it forms uh, fruiting bodies and sporocaps, as you, as you see here. So after um, successive stages, like 
cryogamy, meiosis and sporulation, the basidospores are dispersed uh, into the local environment and, uh, and, and then the mycelium can be formed again and again. So in nature, uh, we mostly after observe this uh, dikaryotic stage with the host trees and this is uh, how uh, ectomacorrhizas can be uh, observed. So the experimental setup looks like this. Uh, Myra started to isolate spores from a single spore, co spore carp to form a collection of monocaryons. Here, about 41 monocaryons. And uh, in the course of this experiment, five uh, spontaneous dikaryons were formed within the petri dishes. And to make sure that we had this uh, uh, either single nucleus or uh, two unfused nuclei, uh, my uh, microscopy check was done uh, to, for each of these monocurrent and decurrents. So phenotyping was performed in two uh, steps. First, it was this image processing every five, uh, oh, sorry, seven days to assess several traits, uh, ectomacrosal traits, from the number of ectomacrosal root tips, lateral root tips, percentage of ectomacrosal root tips, uh, root length and diameter, so it looks like this. And in the second step, um, at the end of the experiment, additional traits were measured, like the ectomacrosal length, the diameter of lateral root tips, the monthal thickness, uh, the length and width of epidermal cells. And in total, um, I will present today 12 traits uh, for the, the GWAS approach. So here it's, as you see, uh, there is just the popular root tips without any uh, fungus around. And here it's an ectomacrosa here between epidermal cells of the, of the popular roots. So it was surprising to see that um, we have high uh, variability in these ectomacrosal traits uh, within these siblings monocarians. Again, it's, it's a single family, they are brothers and sisters. And as you can see here, um, I can show you the gradient. So you have here all the strains on the x-axis, on the y-axis you have the percentage of roots colonized by the fungus. So if we zoom in, here, they are the parental dikaryons that uh, form about 20, 25% of the roots of the dikaryon. The parental dikaryon had a colonization of this, uh, of this uh, fungus. Uh, while for the monocaryons, we had a broad range from 0% uh, to 55% of the roots that were colonized by pisolitus. So again, that's the structure, typical structure you can observe with intermediate forms up to fully, almost fully colonized root tips. So how can we explain such uh, phenotypic plasticity? Uh, so now comes genomics. Um, based on uh, full genome sequencing data, uh, we found these high recombination rates as most likely the source of genotypic variation. So that's what you can see here with the network analysis. Um, with here I plot the three monocaryons that I was showing just before along the gradient. So there is no uh, clear uh, genetic stratification that is uh, fitting with the percentage of macroization rates. So interesting part uh, when we try to link genomics uh, with these traits is to ping-pong whether genes are involved in, in these uh, phenotypic variations. We use this linearmics model with a first step uh, fitting a neural model for people that are interested in these things. And in the second step, every SNP uh, was test testing against these 12 uh, ectomacrosal traits. Um, I used uh, genetic relatedness matrix uh, to control for family effects, so some of you would think why I'm, I'm using that. Although I have a single family, I can detail a little bit more later if you want. Uh, but basically, it's uh, interesting to see whether a family effect has an impact on each of the 12 traits 
although we have a restricting number of samples, so 40 monocurrents, we correct pretty much yeah, for the uh, genetic stratification. And uh, however, uh, we have a lack of statistical power to detect significant SNPs. Here, that's the genome-wide threshold uh, that we, we, we set up. So the results I will show you just right now, this is based on uh, the top 1% SNPs and not on the FDR. So there is two main statistics uh, we can have a look uh, to compare the traits. The first is the FX size of each SNPs for the particular traits. So there is the 12 traits in the X axis. And what you can see here is that uh, for this particular trait, the number of lateral roots, we have a high FX size, meaning that the fungus induce the production of roots. So that makes sense to us. And also, if you look at the percentage of macroization, it is uh, quite elevated compared to the background. For the proportion of variants explained, uh, there is one an in interesting trait here. It's the number of mycorrhizas that have an elevated median value. Uh, but overall, I would say it's, uh, it's pretty homogeneous and with a value of 0.2 that is quite, uh, yeah, we used. To go beyond the SNP level, um, we can have a look at the annotation. Uh, it's very preliminary results, but basically most of these SNPs have a modifier effect uh, and are located in inter intergenic uh, space here, but a third are affecting transcripts and have an, an impact on the protein coding regions. So that's quite promising. This is the 12 traits together. So I don't have the time to show it for each trait. And uh, I don't show you here an enrichment analysis, but this is something that we want to do very soon. So now from the transcriptomic sites, um, looking at these three monocurrents I show you just before, it's interesting, and uh, two lifestyles. So either the fungal strains was grown alone in a petri dish, it's what we call the free living mycelium, or it was grown with the poplar roots. Uh, so it's a nectomacroza. Uh, we can see that most of the differences uh, between monocurrents are, sorry, we can see that the differences between monocurrents are bigger than the differences between lifestyles. And this is somehow unexpected. But here I have to say that this is the overall uh, gene regulation patterns, um, the overall gene regulation patterns. And uh, we have about three replicates for each trait. So you see that the variation is really low uh, between uh, the samples. So it's interesting to see that the parental decurrent is at the middle here. And this is actually where we could, uh, we could expect it. Um, now, if we compare the interactions between the four strains, we see that um, there is very few uh, common signal uh, between the four, which somehow makes sense because these strains, M91, actually doesn't form ectomacrosis with popular roots. So this number is, most, is more interesting because that's the one from which the three strains are forming ectomacrosis with the clone. And this is the case for both the down-regulated genes and the up-regulated genes in comparison to the uh, free living mycelium sample. And again, if we look at the M91 uh, in both types of regulations, this is the one that has the lowest uh, signal in the data. And interestingly, um, if you rank these uh, up and down-regulated uh, gene levels you see that more you are, more the strains are forming uh, uh, ectomacrosis, sort of, um, more the gene regulation uh, levels are high. So that's quite interesting. So, and uh, here you have the parental decurrent. So this is the three monocurrents here and here with one shift here. But yeah. so this is now based on um, double cl hierarchical clustering analysis. We can compare the groups, so either the strains forming um, uh, ectomycorrhizas and the other uh, growing alone in the petri dish. 
So that's the freely DMS area here. It's interesting that we have two functional clusters uh, that are very well clustering together with this exception, which is the M91 again, which doesn't form actually ectoma cruzza, so that makes really sense to have it here. And if we look at uh, the other topology at the top here, every little tiny column is actually a gene, a gene expression, uh, relative low or versus relative high expression, depending on the color here on the right axis. And you have a very interesting block of genes here that uh, we're supposed to be uh, regulated or involved in regulation um, with ectomacrazole traits, and this is the ones that we really want to, to, to have a look closer. Now, if we look at the transcriptomic data in Poplar this time, we see a, a very similar pattern, so strain-specific uh, interactions as I showed, you, I showed you just before uh, with the vein diagrams, which I'm sure. And if we look at the principal component analysis, it's again the same um, form here along the first axis. You have the strains that are able to form ectomacrizes, uh, so M120, M57, and M91 is a bit apart, and uh, this is interesting because it means that the transcripts in popular roots have also this signal uh, has a has a overall uh, genomic profile. So that's the people involved uh, in a project. Uh, that's you recognize Mara and Agret and, and Martina, and I have to thank all the people involved, mostly the um, GGI group. Uh, with Igor Grigoriev and Jonathan Plett, who gave us early access to the reference genome, people from the University of Vitsozza, and, um, and all the people uh, from, uh, from um, INRAI, NASI. We have a fantastic group, I have to say, so thanks to them. <laughs> and I would be happy to take any questions.